Hello, this is Janet Tsai from Tri Service General Hospital, and I'm going to discuss about the diagnosis and management of this patient. Let's take a closer look at the diagnosis and treatment. As shown here, we can recap the patient's data. His video EEG recordings demonstrate violent movements with concurrent EEG change. His MR and PET results were unrevealing. However, we did find a likely pathogenic mutation of the MPI2 gene. The seizure attacks occur predominantly at night and are familial. So, a tentative diagnosis of familial sleep-related hyperkinetic epilepsy is made. The next question is what is MPR2 gene and what is its function? As we know, mTOR pathway hyperactivation plays an important role in developing epilepsy. The most famous one is tuberous sclerosis complex. The mutation we found, the MPR2 gene, belongs to a subgroup of enteropathy, which is called gateropathy. Gateropathy has three members, being DEPTEC5, MPR2, and MPR3. The main role of gator complex is to decrease the activity of mTOR pathway. Thus, impairment of gator pathway leads to hyperactivation of mTOR pathway and lead to the development of epilepsy. mTOR pathway has many subgroups. Some mutation cause diseases mainly affect the brain, while others may cause more systemic manifestations. The presentation of gator one related focal epilepsy is an example of brain-only enteropathy. Let's take a look at gator one related epilepsy. The age of onset is variable from infancy to adulthood. About half of the patients have drug-resistant epilepsy. The sudep rate is high, nearly 9% and nearly 45% of the patients have cognitive and psychiatric comorbidities. As for epilepsy phenotypes, the most common one is sleep-related hyperkinetic epilepsy, followed by FFEVF and other focal epilepsies. The majority of gator one related epilepsy is caused by mutations in the DEPDEC5 gene, followed by MPIL2 and MPIL3 genes. Most of the mutations are inherited and loss of function mutation being the major type, followed by missense mutation. Some may ask if any medication adjustments should be made in patients diagnosed with gateropathies. Although the clinical evidence is not strong, considering the pathogenesis mTOR inhibitor may be tried in patients with loss of function mutation. However, because missense variants carry inconclusive results, further studies are warranted. Based on current discussion, we revisit the diagnosis as gateropathy related drug resistant epilepsy caused by a novel autosomal dominant inherited MPIL2 missense mutation with sleep-related hyperkinetic epilepsy phenotype. Let's move on to the treatment. Aside from anti seizure medications, epilepsy surgery is beneficial to selected epilepsy patients. In other words, drug-resistant epilepsy patients. However, there are many misconceptions about epilepsy surgery, as shown here. When patients developed drug-resistant epilepsy, defined as poor seizure control despite taking two well-selected anti-seizure medications, more invasive treatment should be considered. Before that, a thorough pre-surgical evaluation should be conducted. A patient is diagnosed with focal epilepsy. His MR was non-lesional and PET showed no abnormality. The next question is, should we conduct intracranial recordings? The indications for intracranial evaluation include MR negative cases when other modalities can provide a clue to localization, apparently not in this case. 
Another indications for intracranial evaluation include electroclinical and MR discordance, multiple lesions, and overlap with eloquent cortex. Because our patient didn't fit the criteria for intracranial evaluation, we decide neural modulation as a treatment option. Currently, there are three main types of neural modulation used in epilepsy, VNS, RNS, and DBS. This table showed comparison of treatment of drug-resistant epilepsy. We can see that anti-seizure medication carries the lowest seizure freedom rate. If a epileptogenic focus is well identified, lesion resection serves as a mainstay treatment because higher seizure freedom rate. However, if the patient is not suitable for resection, neuromodulation is another treatment option. Considering neuromodulation methods, VNS is the first approved and most commonly used device to date. The mechanism of action of VNS is that vagal visceral effluents have diffused CNS projection, and activation of these pathways broadly affects neuronal excitability. Studies have shown VNS produce EEG desynchronization. Also, increased release of GABA and glycine by, by brainstem and subcortical nuclei and decrease in glutamate may contribute its effectiveness. Selection of potential candidates is important. Epilepsy patients with drug-resistant epilepsy who are not suitable for resective surgery are the target candidates. Use of VNS therapy is contraindicated in patients with prior bilateral or left cervical vagotomy. And safety and efficacy have not been established for stimulation of the right vagus nerve. Patients with pulmonary and heart diseases should be evaluated for risk of dyspnea and conduction disorders. And patients with OSA may worsen their apneic events after VNS implantation. VNS is a favorable treatment option for a wide range of patients regardless of age and seizure type and is safe for pediatric and geriatric patients. Patients with epilepsy syndrome and genetic epilepsy could benefit from VNS implantation as listed here. But patients with epileptic spasms and tonic spasms pose the lowest response rate. Compared to adults, children may respond more quickly and may require higher output currents. Regarding the pregnant patient population, Although there is currently no such controlled trials, published papers show that VNS is a safe treatment during pregnancy, and turning off VNS during pregnancy is unnecessary. Compared to another two methods in neuromodulation, VNS poses the lowest seizure freedom rate, but with a relatively less invasive approach. VNS is generally safe and well tolerated. Most common complications of the surgery include infection, postoperative hematoma, and vocal cord paralysis. Although seizure-free is rare in VNS implanted patients, VNS treatment has a chronic progressive prophylactic effect in which total seizure counts are reduced more following chronic VNS implantation. Also, additional benefits like reducing seizure severity and duration and improving quality of life and safety have been reported by studies. Our patients received VNS implantation. Though seizure frequency did not change much, he reported improvement of severity and duration of his seizure and improvement of the quality of life. Thank you for your attention, and I want to thank my teammates Si An and Min Jun, and our beloved tutor Dr. Chen Qian for supporting us and tutoring us. Thank you very much.